so yes, I'm in Rome. I'm I'm close to Rome. I live close to Rome, and um, and you see people. You have consulting rooms in Rome, or or where do you where do you see people? I see people in Rome and uh, close to Rome. I have two studios, two offices, and um, as psychologists, uh, the lockdown was. Um, we were hallowed to see people uh, face to face, but I prefer yeah. to see them online. But in the last three weeks, I start again to see them face to face, even if yeah. this lockdown unlock the online therapy for many people. You know what I mean? People. I think it's interesting because I think we're a long way mm. from being able to see clients or to be to see patients. Yeah. And I, I think our work is going to move substantially yeah. online. Yeah. And in all honesty, I think this is a moment when, well, for training, um, I think it's a, a sea change, really, for, cha for training. Yeah. And I think I would say in future, the greater part of my training work is going to end up online. Yeah. Uh, I think there's going to be much less face-to-face -face training from now on. I think so. I think the same. Consider that my girlfriend, uh, she's a dance teacher. And dance, you know, is something that you uh, you could think that it's impossible to, to do online. But it's not true. Many people also, great dancer uh, like Roberto Bolle, you know, did a lot of training online. Uh, actually, uh, while we are talking, uh, she is about to starting a intensive week of training. Um, she she will she will not teach. She will uh, have lesson. Um, and uh, in in a contemporary dance, uh, which it, it's it's strange, you know, and it's in a way related to our topic because uh, for many. Here, so many decades, we think that one thing is that thing, and that thing could be done all in that way. Yeah. Then something happened, like yeah. World War II, that. and suddenly you realize it could have been done differently. I, I mean, thinking about it now, uh, you know, for some time I've been saying we should move our training online. Mm -hmm. Partly because I felt uh, yeah, guilty at some level about the amount of flying. You know, my carbon emission yeah. each year was in some ways ridiculously high. And I would try and do all sorts of things about it. But, you know, I was flying a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking for quite a long time, we have to stop this. This has to stop. We need to move online. We don't need to be doing this. And there was always a reason not to make the change. And now suddenly this happens and we have to make the change yeah. and it will happen. And it's, it's something that, um, you know, I've, uh, I've been thinking about. Oddly enough, we had um, an invitation today to go to Vietnam to do some teaching. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go to Ho Chi Minh City, and um, there was a little bit of me that was thinking, oh, that would be quite nice, that would be <laughs> quite interesting going to Vietnam, and then I thought, no, let's offer them an online course, yeah. see if we can do it online. Is there uh, a moment in brief history, your institute, Yora and uh, Chris and Harvey yeah. Institute, in which you had this kind of switch and um, you started to do things in the way that you do it now uh, about your model of solution focus or I, I don't know I, I think I presume that is something more it was something more gradual but even in gradual process there is sometimes a um, haha moment you know an insight or a switching point oh my goodness i mean look this is asking us to look back a long way really mm. um, 
I mean, the team, we started working together using Solution Focus in 1987. And in 1987, look, as, as you know, Solution Focus was very much an exception-based model. And the exceptions, the idea that problems didn't happen all the time, that people came with solutions, that was completely central. And the picturing or describing of the preferred future was secondary in the approach. You know, Steve Deshazer used to say that actually he asked about the preferred future only or merely to work out which exceptions were relevant. Mm. Like the word he used to use was salient. Which exceptions were salient? And so the preferred future and the picturing of it was actually a very much there in order to support the usefulness of the exceptions. Mm. And when you looked at Steve's work in the early days, um, his describing of the preferred future was very, I mean, we would call it broad brush. There wasn't much detail. There wasn't much fine detail in the descriptions. And quite why we began to do it differently, I'm not quite sure. Chris says, Chris Iveson says, that it was because he misunderstood what Steve wanted, that he thought, you know, that Steve wanted, you know, as we read Steve's work, that he wanted a much more detailed picturing of it. And so we began to invite people into much, much more detailed descriptions. And as we did that, I suppose what began to happen was the place of exceptions and the place of the preferred future, they switched place. Hmm. So suddenly, the picturing of the preferred future began to appear to us much more central and much more significant. And just inviting people to describe the futures that they wanted in detail, it became clear to us that just doing that itself made a difference. Itself, it was, if you like, therapeutic. It made a difference just doing it. And that was, I think, one of the big changes in our work. Obviously, the other one was moving away from Steve DeShazer's traditional starting point, which he would ask people, what brings you here? Mm -hmm. Which pretty well always would take people into a problem description. It's my depression, it's my anxiety, you know, it's my drinking, whatever it was. And moving towards a more solution focused starting. And in the end, we ended up with this question so, what are your best hopes from our talking together? Mm. And look, I can't actually remember which came first, but the two things were very connected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The way that the preferred future, the picture of the preferred future became central and the moving away from what brings you here to so what are your best hopes from our talking together and um look one of the things that steve writes about and he writes about it in his third book clues mm -hmm. the phrase he uses is straightening the line he says you know people want to get from a to b it's our job to find the straightest line. And I guess at Brief, we got really, really interested in this idea of straightening the line. Mm. And obviously asking people what brings you here actually takes you on a diversion into the problem. So we thought, well, that's not a very straight line. And of course, the whole idea of exceptions, that didn't seem very much of a straight line either in the sense that exceptions are exceptions to the rule of the problem. So you actually have to know what the problem is in order to be able to establish the exceptions. Yeah. And so we came up with this phrase, this word, instances, little bits of the preferred future that actually are in place or people are already doing. And what we then had was a straighter line. And all of these things, they were very much interwoven. 
And I very hard for me to say when it started. Mm -hmm. Very hard for me to say that. But somewhere, but I would say between 1995, 96, 97, 98, 99, our picturing of the approach really changed radically. Really changed radically.